Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 89. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we discuss recent plays of War Chest, Impact Battle of Elements, and Carcassonne South Seas. We've got a six-pack review and an on-tap of Passeria Supermarket Manager, a beer primer on winter warmers, and in our final round, we asked our Slack channel for their opinions on deck builders. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. With a tightly cold inventory? Yeah, right. I'm just going to go into our closet absolutely chock full of beer and oh, uh, find a couple of things that I'm looking for. <laughs> tightly controlled inventory, my tuckus. Like, it seemed perfectly reasonable. We're talking about Passaraya Supermarket Manager in our feature today, which is a game about controlling your inventory in your supermarket and also has a really interesting deck calling and controlling mechanism you don't really see in deck builders. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's funny, after I wrote that in there and said that, I thought about, okay, well, we're board game people and we're craft beer people and neither of those things are tightly controlled. But so how about with dreams of a tightly cold inventory? Can we do that? Yes, All that right. sounds reasonable. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, everybody. If this is your first episode of Draft Mechanic, thank you so much for joining us. If you're a returning listener, we love you all as well. You can find us on the internet, draftmechanic.net, at Draft Mechanic, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the usual places. We also have a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up for this episode, as there is for every episode. So if you have some opinions on what we're talking about, that would be the place to leave them. And also, if you're on Board Game Geek, we do have a micro badge you can pick up, like our new micro badger, Hal Duncan. Thank you so much, Hal, for picking up the Draft Mechanic micro badge. If you want to grab it, hit up the guild. There's a thread for it. Or if you need geek gold, let us know. We got plenty of geek gold. I got geek gold everywhere. That's weird. It should I, only be on BGG. I only have geek gold on board game geek, I guess. <laughs> if you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we do meetups twice a month. Our next one is going to be on Thursday, December 6th at Good Road Cider Works. Mm -hmm. That is on the first Thursday of every month. So uh, we'll be headed there again in January. And then on the third Tuesday of every month, we have a meetup at Salud Cerveceria in the Noda neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we would love to see you come out on the 6th, or if you can't, can't make that one, then on the uh, third Tuesday mm -hmm. and play some games, have some fun. It is always a great time. Mm -hmm. So we actually had our Salud meetup since last time we talked on the podcast here, and they have their food now. By the way, Salud has food. It is so freaking good. They've got great pizzas and good salads. The salads are really good, too. And yeah. this is like their super light, soft opening menu. I'm so excited. I'm so happy that they got a new food option in there. You know, we were all kind of bummed out when food at Salud left a while ago. But uh, yeah, if you're coming out to one of these meetups, the Salud one now has food. Yay! And all the food is named after Outcast songs. Why not? That's kind of that's kind of their whole their that's whole. Deal. Their thing. That's the thing. But before that, if you were looking to do something this coming weekend, you might be attending PAX Unplugged up in the Philly area. And I am going. I'm going to be demoing some at the Gray Fox Games booth, our sponsor. I'm going to go do City of Gears from 2 to 6 p.m. on uh, Friday and Saturday. So if you ever wanted to meet me in person, come by and say hi while I'm doing the City of Gears demo. Or if you'd like to learn how to play City of Gears. Oh, yeah. Or I mean, if you'd just like to buy some Gray Fox games. They do have a number of games. And uh, I did just learn, this will actually tie into a new story in a little bit. Board and Dice will be there, and they're probably going to have maybe 50-ish copies of Escape Tales. Ooh. So if you were going to PAX Unplugged and you were hearing this, this is the hot tip. Rush to booth 1913. Actually, 1917 is Board and Dice, but they're on the back of the Gray Fox Games booth. So it's, you know, you can go to either of those numbers and then get a copy of Escape Tales because it was just so freaking cool. We talked about it on our last episode last week. If you missed that one, go back and listen to it. Or just get this game because I think it's freaking fantastic and one of the best of the year. Sounds good. You will also have badge ribbons as well, right? Oh, yeah. I'm going to bring some of the Draft Mechanic badge ribbons, and uh, I'll be wearing one, and you can have one as well. Hooray! Speaking of Draft Mechanic branded things... Oh, yeah. We have two new Draft Mechanic t-shirts that kind of just decided to happen in the last week or so. I mean, we decided that they were going to happen. The shirts didn't autonomously decide that they were going to exist. Yeah, I've been playing with a, a design kind of based on our Carcassonne segment for a long time, so you can now get a shirt that has the world-famous Carcassonne logo on it. I find it very fun, and I have one 
one, ordered it from Redbubble, and already got it. And you have the other one that we kind of dreamed up because we were looking at the cat, and he's kind of part of this whole thing. Yeah, so if you want to tote that you listen to a podcast recorded in front of a live studio cat, and you want a big <laughs> picture of our cat's face on you, then we have the t-shirt for you. <laughs> that is an option. Yes, if you've ever wanted to know what the live studio cat looks like, you will see him staring directly into your soul on the live studio cat t-shirt. All of these are available at Redbubble on our Redbubble store. You can also just go to draftmechanic.net and click the banner up at the very top that says go here for t-shirts because that makes it really easy. And you don't have to remember redbubble.com slash people slash draftmechanic mechanic slash shop is that oh, what it, i think that what it is i don't know i'm the only person that needs to remember that kind of stuff on the regs so there it was a little bit of board game news that i thought was kind of interesting board and dice our friends at board and dice we just talked about a few se- segments ago they have merged with nskn games and as such they've got a lot of cool things coming up including an escape tales too i'm Yay. clapping you're excited uh this game called sierra west that i've known that they've had coming for a little while it's kind of like a card based hour playing euro game and it looks like it has variable setups so you can do different kind of card structures to play through this game i don't know a whole much more about that and also a hot title out of essen that nskn games had tia to so they are apparently going to have that as one of the big games that they are supporting going forward they also have a spicy new clean logo that is based on the original board and dice logo so it looks like they're going to be keeping that branding and like i said they're going to be at uh pax unplugged so go by and give them a high five and then get escape tales if there's any left there you go daniel you had an interesting note from the world of beer you wanted to talk about i did if you have been looking at the U.S. news at all lately, it will not come as a surprise to you that California has been experiencing some absolutely severe wildfires. And the Camp Fire, which is the one that is right in the area of the Sierra Nevada Brewing Brewery, was by far, I would say, the worst of them. Entire towns were wiped off the map. People have lost their homes. Unfortunately, a, a fairly large number of people have died. And Sierra Nevada, while their brewery escaped destruction, wanted to give back to the community that they are a part of. So they started something called the Sierra Nevada Campfire Relief Fund. And what they have asked is they are going to brew on what is called Giving Tuesday, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. They're going to brew a beer called Resilience, and they have asked other breweries to brew this beer as well and to donate the proceeds that come from that beer to that relief fund that they had set up. It was started with $100,000 of Sierra Nevada's seed money for that fund, but they're asking that anybody who brews this resilience beer, and they're distributing the recipe and working with malt and hop purveyors to get the malts and the hops out to breweries who are pledging to brew this beer. They're asking that anybody who brews it also donate the proceeds to this Hmm. relief fund. And it's idea for the relief fund is that right now there's a lot of focus on this but this community is going to be rebuilding for a very very long time so this is a fund that is meant to spur long-term recovery efforts in the community so there are over a hundred breweries that have pledged to brew this beer including i know in our local area wooden robot and noda brewing have Mm. both pledged to brew it and they're asking that people sell this beer and donate the proceeds. So if you would like to go to SierraNevada.com and check out the list of breweries that are going to be brewing this so you can check out who in your area is going to have it, you you can go and get a beer that is going to be, a, I'm sure, a tasty beer. Sierra Nevada doesn't really make bad beers. They make good quality beers. So they've developed this recipe and you'll get a beer and you, you'll know that the proceeds from that beer are going to help people who desperately need it. That's awesome. So, yeah, go check out that list. Find your local version of Resilience and go drink it. Yeah, we'll have notes in the show notes, links to all that stuff. Definitely. There will be a link to the page that lists all the breweries and such. Cool. Well, should we move on to do some Kickstarters like we do at this time? We can. Cool. Danielle, you got the updates from last one? I do. Atlantis Rising, which is from Elf Creek Games, is currently funding at 102000 of its $20,000 goal, and it has 1,522 backers. This project ends on December 1st, so you still have time to go back it. Deluxe backers are now getting a limited edition numbered box. They've unlocked a ton of stretch goals, including components for a seventh player. Yeah, that was an interesting move. And when I was playing this with them last week, they said that that was the kind of thing that they were thinking about doing. And I feel like, you know, it's the kind of game that the only thing that's going to happen when you include seven players there is that you have more different interesting player powers and it's going to really kind of 
amplify the decisions and the possibilities of your gameplay. It's also going to make it way harder because more stuff is coming out a lot faster. So I'm really excited to see that. And I like the way that they're doing this deluxe backer thing. Anybody who was a deluxe backer is getting this nice upgraded box and stuff, and they're not adding exclusive content. They're just putting it in a a nicer box at this point. That's a good way to do a little extra thank you to Kickstarter backers. So I'm really kind of behind that. Next up, we have Imagineers from Maple Games. This is funding at $14,000 of its $10,000 goal with 288 backers. This ends on Sunday, December 2nd, so this is also still available for backing. And it will unlock solo stretch mode at the $15,000 backing level, so they're so close to that. I can't imagine that in the next, what, (laughs) week they're not going to get another $1,000 worth of backers. Yeah. So it should have a solo mode out there. Mm -hmm. And finally, Pipeline from Capstone Games is funding at $108,000 of its $20,000 goal with 1,676 backers. This ends on Monday, December 3rd, because we need to have consecutive days on all of our Kickstarter (laughs) end dates. I did put them in order just for that reason. Yeah, that would have been really annoying if you hadn't. (laughs) We have got add-ons for metal cubes at this point on that Kickstarter, and that will replace the wood ones that had originally been slated to come with the game. Yeah, it's an interesting little add-on, and I don't know how I feel about that. Honestly, I love wooden cubes. I think that wooden cubes are a really great component. And metal cubes, I'm just afraid that they're going to dent everything and hurt well, me it's an when add-on. I get them thrown at me. So you don't have to buy them, right? <laughs> you don't have to buy them. Okay. It's like 10 or 15 bucks, and it's like 60 or 70 metal cubes, or maybe a lot more. It's a lot of cubes, and they're all metal. So if you like metal cubes, here's an opportunity. If you don't like metal cubes... You you don't have to buy them. You don't have to buy them. All right, so I got three new projects. I'm going to go kind of quick through the first one here. Aeon's End, the deck building game, has a digital implementation on Kickstarter right now, being done by Handle Opera Games. Uh, It's currently at $26,000 of its $30,000 goal with about 1,200 backers. This one ends on Tuesday, December 4th, which is another consecutive day, just for you. With an estimated delivery of June 2019, you can back it for $15, $20 to get the Kickstarter edition with some special digital content, or you can spend a bit more and get into the beta or the alpha build teams, which is kind of cool. I guess if you want to get on that stuff earlier. The reason I wanted to include this, two reasons. One, I really like Handelabra's development. We talked about One Deck Dungeon in the past about that app, and you really enjoyed it, right? I love that. It's so much so that I have sort of put our physical copy on the for trade pile, because while Mm -hmm. it's a great game, I love the digital implementation so much more. Yeah, and the other reason I wanted to include this, this one is actually sorted under the video games category rather than tabletop games, which, of course, makes perfect sense. But I feel like a lot of people like me probably just continue to scrape the tabletop games menu on Kickstarter for looking at what kind of new projects there are. And stuff like this that's app implementations of games, definitely want to make sure people are aware of it and know that it's out there. Um, I've heard a lot of great things about Aeon's End. I haven't played it ever, but I trust Handelabra with card games. They've also done Sentinels of the Multiverse, So their reputation for card game implementations is always just fantastic. Do you know if this is including any of the expansion content? Um, I know that they are working to implement that, and I think that it will not be available immediately. I know that it's just DLC. Yeah, it'll probably have DLC in the future. Cool. Yeah, so check out that on the video games menu in Kickstarter. It is Aeon's End Digital Edition. Next up is Rallyman GT from Holy Grail Games. This one is well-funded, 84000 of its $23,000 goal with a little over 1,500 backers. It ends on Thursday, December 6th. I'm sorry, we've skipped the 5th. There are no projects on this episode ending on the 5th. It has an estimated delivery of November 2019 and just one pledge, 56 bucks for the game. Now, this is a modernized version of a classic roll-and-move racing game, but not like roll and then move that many spaces like in Formula Day or something like that. The way this works is you move one space per die. You have a set of six dice that are the six gears of your car, one through six, and depending on what gear you are in, there are more warning faces on those dice. So if you want to move four spaces and you're in gear one, you'll lay out the one, two, three, and four dice on the board in front of your car. You always have to either increase or decrease, you know, sequentially when you're laying out your dice. And then you can decide either to roll them one at a time and push your luck that way, or you can roll all of them together and get some focus tokens. But the danger, of course, is if you have a specific number, I think it's three of those warning signs, you spin out, you take some damage. So it's kind of an interesting way to use dice in a racing game, and I'm kind of interested to see how this one works. I want to look more into this game. I'm also really interested because apparently the track itself has specific conditions, like maybe in this corner you can't go above a two, or in this area, you know, you can use this space, but only as a gear four, because it's a a longer, wider space. And 
that's a really interesting and cool mechanic that I'm really kind of want to know more about. The board is also modular instead of being individual boards like a downforce or formula day were in the past. I know that this one is like hex tiles and you can set them up and they also have like a crossover bridge as a Kickstarter exclusive piece. It looks really cool. And I want to probably look into this one a little bit more. Is that any interesting to you at all? No. No. Oh. I didn't really <laughs> like Formula Day, and the modular board sounds like, oh, what was the bicycle racing game? Uh, that, Flum Rouge? Yeah. Flum Rouge had a mo- uh, modular board so that you could set up the track differently. I don't know. I feel like Downforce really fulfills all of my racing needs. It has those sort of hazards that we had talked about in the Danger Circuit review that we did, so that mirrors the mm-hmm. sections where you had different gear requirements that you were talking about in this. I can see how this would be an interesting racing game for somebody who really liked racing games, but I feel like Downforce really covers me on racing games. So okay. if you like racing games, though, sounds interesting. Yeah. Sounds better than Formula D. Yeah, I really I like that pusher luck, and I like the interesting track conditions having requirements for different gears. So I'm going to look into it a little bit more. I mean, you know, you got about, a, what, two weeks to go on this one? Thursday, December 6th, week and a half? Yeah, it's worth checking out, I think. But that is Rallyman GT. Finally, I have kind of an interesting project. This is a game called Metal, and it's being produced by Lay Waste Games and also Jordan Draper Games. Jordan Draper is a designer that previously brought us the Tokyo series of games, and we actually just got in the last few days. Currently funding a little bit over its $20,000 goal, 600 backers. Metal ends on Thursday, December 13th, with an estimated delivery of June 2019. It's just one pledge, $35 and $10 shipping for Metal. Now, what is Metal? Well, this is a game completely made of metal. All of the pieces, everything in it, including the box, is entirely made of metal, all sorts of different metals. So you're going to get some balls, some pins, some batons, and stuff like that, because metal is a set of three classic lawn games, plus three newly designed games reformatted for tabletop. So it has the rule sets for bocce and cube and croquet, but it also has these three new games, not pool, Yes, not pool, bangers, and also team meeting. And it's a really interesting way to approach kind of the the tabletop micro game situation, because you see a lot of times they'll do like, oh, it's tabletop bocce, but they're all little, you know, acrylic balls or something like that. Or, oh, it's pool, but it's just wooden pins or bowling with wooden pins. Going all out on the metal is a really interesting decision. And apparently this is a series of games that Jordan Draper wants to do that are all composed of an entire element. There's another one that is all uh, fabrics. There's another one coming that's all wood, stuff like that. And he's using Lay Waste Games for production. Lay Waste Games did Dragoon that I feel like we've talked about a few episodes ago. And one of the things that you had to say was how awesome the metal pieces in that game were. Yes, the metal pieces in that game were very good. Team meeting sounds like the dumbest (laughs) lawn game ever. Like, I don't want to go to team meeting when it's not a lawn game. Yes. I'd be interested to see what this is. I'm very surprised at the shipping price, Mm because I figured the shipping on this would be absolutely through the roof, since you're mailing a whole box literally made of metal and full of metal. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to see that. Um, Bocce and Cube and Croquet are not games that generally I would think that people would be marketing towards tabletop gamers. Mm-hmm. Bocce's a great game. I, I'm not, I haven't played croquet in years and I've never played cube, but I mean, it's an interesting choice. And with these three new games, maybe that'll bring people in because they'll want to know what these newer games are. I can't really imagine Bocce being played with metal balls. That sort of, yeah, that would be a lot of clanging and a lot of knocking things off of table, denting your floor. Yeah, I mean, are they made to be played on the table, or are they actual lawn games? That no, it's tabletop size, so okay, it's meant so to be played on your gonna, table. You're, you're going to dent your, your table real good. Yeah, maybe maybe instead of throwing the bocce, you uh, just gently roll it down the table. Do you have to put a little piece of astroturf on your table? <laughs> yes, and you have to have these tiny little two by fours. You get a copy of Tokyo Highway, and there you go. You build your little frame like. Is that. it metal astroturf? It is. Oh man, I don't even want to get into the implications of that. I don't know. Like when when I was looking this up, I'm like. Okay, well, this is going to be super expensive. 35 bucks for tabletop games that are high-quality metal? That is a lot cheaper than I expected. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not arguing that the production won't be good. Yeah. I'm just kind of wondering about the premise. The necessity is a little odd, but I think that's kind of why I put it in the segment, because it's an interesting and weird project that somebody out there right now is probably about to click on Kickstarter and uh, or back that thing. There you go. If you did, let us know, because why not? You know, now you got some metal. Cool? Yep. All right. Well, time to move on to some recent plays. So, yeah. No, that's it. That's the whole segue. 
Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. First up in recent plays, we have Impact Battle of Elements. This is a 2018 release from Ravensburger. Plays two to five players in about 15 minutes. This is designed by Deer Newsel with art by Agency Cactus and Fiore GmbH. This is a game of elements battling for supremacy in a cauldron. You mean dice in a bowl? 2.0. But dice in a bowl. <laughs> If you have ever played Strike or had Strike explained to you, the rules for Impact Battle of Elements are going to sound really familiar. Each player is going to start with a certain number of dice. In two players, it is eight, and then for most other player counts, it is six, and I think it goes down to five for highest Mm -hmm. player counts. Each of these dice have one blank side, and the other five sides have elements inscribed onto them they're custom dice so you have a rock you have a little fireball you have a water droplet you have a lightning bolt and you have some wind which is theoretically a hurricane yes the wind it looks like a small gust but whatever (laughs) you are going to start with one additional die in a plastic bowl which is a plastic indentation with some craft (laughs) foam on the bottom of it that is sitting inside the base of the box. You open the box up and you play right in the bottom portion of the box. Put one die in there. The face that the die that is started in the bowl rolls is the special rules for this round of the game. So if you roll a blank face, I think you just re-roll it until you get one of the five element faces. Mm -hmm. So for example, you may have a fire side up, and that means that anytime you roll a match that is fire, you're going to need to stack up all your dice. They're, these are the kind of special rules. But I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Players are going to take turns rolling their dice, generally one at a time, into the bowl slash cauldron slash <laughs> arena slash whatever. If you get a match of any of the dice in the playing area you are going to take all of the dice that match into your personal pool of dice, assuming that there is not a rule that changes that based on the round. You can continue rolling one die at a time, as many dice as you want, as long as you have them, taking any pairs that match. You can also, at any point, once you've thrown at least one die, you can pass, and the next player will start throwing their dice in. If at any point all of the dice in the bowl match, you're going to take all of them out, and the next player needs to roll all of their dice at the same time. They'll still get to take any matches, but if there are no matches, they're not going to have any dice left and they'll be out of the round. You're going to keep going around until all but one player runs out of dice and that player is the winner. If you happen to be a listener of Rolling Dice and Taken Names, our friends on the south side of Charlotte, you've no doubt heard about Strike a whole ton. They host a yearly meetup where they do a strike tournament at Gen Con. And this year, the winner got the very first uh, English copy of Impact Battle of Elements. And everybody was very excited for them. And Strike... Well, Impact, either or, is the kind of game that is not going to be super deep strategically, and it's just going to be basically rolling some dice and having a whole lot of fun with it. And I think that's kind of what has always excited me about this game. And finally, having Impact available here in the United States is great, because Strike was never available to us. You could import it if you were lucky and you found a copy somewhere online from like Amazon DE, but finally having a copy of this that is the official thing, that is not just dice and a bowl, is really nice. And I'm glad that it's available. But it is really just dice in a bowl. Yeah, I mean, it might just be dice that you roll into a bowl area, but I will say, production-wise, the dice are very good quality. I agree. I do really like the fact that all of the sides have color that is distinct in addition to their symbols that are distinct, which is really nice. I like that they have symbols in addition to their color, because yeah. for colorblind folks, that is going to be a big mm-hmm. lifesaver. Mm-hmm. And they all they are all really nice. They're indented etchings on the dice it's Mm -hmm. not just like a sticker that's slapped on there that could come off or something it is fully made custom dice Mm -hmm. and there is a little bit of a strategy to the cauldron itself this is a rectangular kind of area this time and it does have a little bit of texture on the sides it looks like there's kind of like three stadium seating rows kind of around the side which strike had as well if i remember yeah it did but the strike one was more of an oval and i think that the sides were a little less vertical um, and also, you know, obviously not rounded corners. And obviously the piece of foam at the bottom gives it a little bit more bounce, but not so much that stuff flies right out. It's also if you throw a die and it goes out of the arena, then that die is lost entirely. 
Um, one thing that is really weird about this one is that they made the box taller in addition to making that arena tighter. So the cauldron arena-ish thing is actually maybe an inch or so elevated off of the table. Like the very base of the inside is elevated an inch. There's just a cardboard inch of raised in the inside. And I guess that you think it was just probably some kind of like art decision. I think it was a decision based on the fact that they had a good bit of information to put on the side yeah. and art assets they wanted to put on the side and the Ravensburger logo takes up one of the corners. Mm -hmm. So it may have been a shelf presence decision. It may have been, it's easier to stand the box on its side if the box is thicker. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it is. It doesn't functionally change the game at all because the depth of the actual plastic blow molded or vacuum molded section is still only about an inch or an inch and a half yeah. deep. You just have extra box filler inside, which you wouldn't actually notice unless you were comparing the depth of the arena to the depth of the box. It's not like it's done poorly. Mm -hmm. It just seems kind of weird that it's sitting above the bottom of the box. And I will say the arena in Impact is definitely a lot smaller than Strikes. Strikes the old strike box was kind of your typical mid-size Alea Ravensburger kind of box, kind of like Las Vegas or something about that size box. And this one is definitely a good bit smaller. I mean, it's probably four by six inches for yeah. that shape, which is going to make a much more crowded thing. You're going to have a lot more bumping and knocking over. But regardless, this is a game that if you like this kind of wacky fun and you love rolling dice into a bowl or elements into a cauldron or even gladiators and arena, it's available finally in the U.S for like under 20 bucks. I do feel like this is a better game than Strike was because mm -hmm. of the variation in the rounds. Because you roll that initial die and you decide what type of game you're going to be playing, or you can just choose it, I suppose, if you like. There's no reason you actually have to mm -hmm. do it randomly. There are no element police. That's true. And you get a different game when you play it. I mean, there is one of them where if you roll a certain color match, you have to stack up all your dice into a big obelisk mm -hmm. shape. And whoever does that the fastest takes all of the matches of that color. I think that's fire. Whatever. It's called yeah. Column of Fire. So if you have fewer dice, which means you are at a disadvantage in the actual game because having dice is beneficial. You can throw more of them and get more matches. If you have fewer dice, you are in a tougher position. It also means that in that style of game, you're at an advantage because if you have two dice, it's very easy to stack two dice as mm -hmm. opposed to if you have like six or seven, getting those all into an obelisk and not having them, them fall over is going to be more difficult. There's one where like if you are playing the, the what is it, Bowlers. landslide or yeah, okay, the rock game. Mm -hmm. If you get a match of the rock icon, you take them out of the cauldron, but you stack them together and they must be rolled together. So you're being forced to play more of your dice than you might otherwise choose to. There's some that add interaction where if you play with the, the wind slash hurricane style, when you match the wind icons, everybody passes their dice pool to the person to their left. So you may be doing great, and then somebody matches Hurricane, and then suddenly you've got the two dice that the person to your right had. So you need to make sure that you are not necessarily uh, leaving the person who you are going to get dice from in a poor position. And it's it's fun and interesting, and I think it adds a little bit more play value to mm -hmm. it because in strike you're just throwing dice into a ball and they're they're literally numbered dice except for the fact that the ones are x's and it doesn't feel as different it feels like okay i play it a couple of times and we're good mm -hmm. whereas this you can play it up to five times and they can all be completely different and mm -hmm. then you've got five times as much replay value on it and if you're completely insane you can play all five rules at the same time that why, is in the rule book why would you we do will this? not be doing that we won't be okay <laughs> yeah but Again, I'm happy that Impact is available here in the U.S., so if that's something you've always been looking for, it looks like it just came out in the last few days, so go hit up your friendly local game store and or retailer and look for a tiny little box with some dice smashing together in a cauldron. <laughs> Next, we're going to talk about War Chest, which is a 2018 release from AEG Games. It plays two or four players in about 30 minutes. The designers are Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson, and the artist is Bridget Indelicato. This is an abstract strategy game of units and hexes. And we got our copy as a review copy from AG. 
So as Danielle said, War Chess is an abstract strategy game where you and an opponent, or you and a partner and uh, opponent team, if it's either two or four players, never three, never once three, are competing for control on this hex board. The hex board is kind of mm, a little bit wide and you know kind of narrow between the two uh, sides that you're playing there. And you have these control spots on the board that are your goals to control. Your goal is to move your units to these spaces and then place a control token onto these particular control spaces. Spaces. Once you have a majority of them, depending on whatever play count, it's either six or eight of them controlled, you will win the game. The way you're going to accomplish this is kind of with a bag building element where you have these nice poker chip style chips that refer to different units. Everybody draws the units randomly, or you can do a drafting style and you get a set of three or four different cards that represent different kinds of units. The units have different ways that they move, different ways they attack, and different ways they interact with the board in, in general. You're going to throw a few of the tokens into your bag, in addition to one kind of generic token that is your royal coin, which is your particular symbol, and you're going to draw a few coins out of the bag on your turn and start taking actions. You have the opportunity to play a token face up to move a matching token on the board somewhere. You can also just play that token directly onto one of your control points you already have if you want to put that unit out on the board. You can only generally have one unit or stack of a type of unit of your stuff on the board. So if you want to, you can also play a token on top of a same kind token out there into the world to bolster it and give it a little more strength. Attacking is pretty straightforward for the most part. When your token is next to an opposing token, you can choose to take that attack action by by discarding a token out of your hand and then attacking them and you do one damage generally. Obviously, there's different units that do all sorts of different things. You also have actions you can take by discarding coins out of your hand face down. Generally, this is how you add more coins to your bag, so you get more of those units for future draws. You can also discard face down to take the initiative token from the other player, so you can be the first player on the next turn, and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of different actions, and obviously, you have a bunch of different tactics that the cards and units have. Maybe this one can uh, attack two spaces away because they're an archer, but that space has to be clear in the middle. There's one that will take a move and then attack ahead of them. They're a lancer or something like that. So on and so forth. They're all pretty thematic for what the type of unit is. But you're going to continue going until somebody controls um, six or eight in a four-player game of those control markers, and then that person is the winner of War Chest. One of the really interesting things about War Chest is managing the economy of your poker chips. Because you have a unit on the board, and the number of chips of that same type of unit that are stacked up on the board are that unit's health. It's important to make sure that your units are strong enough to withstand any attacks that might come at them from mm -hmm. other players. Because once a unit is damaged, a chip is removed off the stack of that pile of unit, and it's removed from the game, and you never get it back. Or if it's only a one-unit high stack, that unit is just removed from the board. They're dead. Yes, they're dead. So it's important that you have, you know, maybe if you're using a unit a lot, you want to have two or maybe even three stacked up together to make that unit really healthy and strong. But so many of the actions require you to spend from your hand a chip of the same kind. If you want to move a unit or attack with a unit, you're going to need to play a chip of that kind. You don't have a ton of chips for each unit. You have somewhere between three and five for yeah. each unit, depending on the power of the unit and its ability to move and that type of thing. They're balanced out so that the weaker units you have a little bit more of and the stronger units you have a little fewer of. But you need to be able to use the chips to take actions with the units you have on the board in addition to making those units stronger. And you only have so many of them. And adding more chips if you do have them to your bag, because only two of each unit start out in the bag, if you want to add any additional ones in, that's going to take one of your turns, and you're not moving or attacking on those turns. So really, the economy of not only moving those chips from in front of you to into your bag, but determining whether you're going to use them for health or for action movement, the action movement ones you'll get back again, but if they're health, you're never going to get them back because they'll either stay on the unit or be killed off. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting and something that I can't think of another game, especially not an abstract strategy game, that makes that particular distinction that you need to make as a player. Yeah, this is an interesting way to approach the culling mechanism you have in a bag or a deck builder. You're really actively deciding where you want your pieces to be, and you don't have a whole lot of pieces to go around. And I'm really excited to see more people coming at 
deck building and bag building with new interesting ideas like that. And I felt it was really tight. There's a lot of times when I'm playing this game where I'm really trying to decide, do I want to use this token to move this thing, or do I want to use this token to bring more tokens into my cycle? It's a very active kind of culling and deck management, or I guess token management in this particular game. Now, Daniel, you've never been a huge fan of abstract strategy games in the past, though. How does this one kind of place on your abstract strategy scale? Okay, I mean, just on my general game scale, you're right. I'm not a huge fan of this, Mm -hmm. just because... Not not because it's a bad game, but because this isn't really my style of game. But there were some things about it that I really liked. I liked that tight economy of chips. But there were also some things about it that were a little bit frustrating and made play a little bit difficult. Mm-hmm. The fact that some of the chips you discarded into your discard pile needed to be discarded face up and some needed to be discarded face down, it was... Um, it was just sort of confusing. You, I often forgot which things were discarded face up or face down and which I could use anything for and which I could only use specific units for. Generally, the way it is is if something has to do with a specific unit, you have to discard a matching token. But sometimes that matching token is face up. And, you know, you have the, that one royal token, which isn't any specific unit, although it does... Be, it is referenced by one of the tactical powers of, yeah. I think, one unit, which is not used in the base setup of the game. So generally, if you're playing with the base setup they recommend, you have this one thing that is only able to be used for face-down movements. And I kept wanting to use it for face-up things. I'm like, oh, that's my wild token. But it, it really only allows you to get more units or to take that initiative token. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really feels like that token should be more useful. But maybe the fact that you get it at all is what is useful about it. Yeah, I mean, it's a free token into your bag. Yeah. I also really wish that they had given player aid cards that just had the rundown of what you can do with each token, Mm. because there is a list of it on the back of the rule book. But if you're playing with two players and everybody needs to, or even if you're playing with four players and everybody needs to check to see what they can do with the tokens in their hand, it may be a minute before you get that thing back. So just a couple of player aid cards, I feel like would have been really useful. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) There's also not a whole lot of planning you can do before your draw, unless you're at the point where you know what the three tokens left in your bag are, because you're drawing three tokens around. If you have a bunch of tokens in your bag, or you have maybe one or two tokens where you're going to be throwing your discard pile back into your bag and then drawing it out again, you can't really plan because so many of those chips require that you discard an identical unit token. If you don't know what you're going to have in your hand, you can't plan beforehand. You can say, I'd like to be able to, you know, attack with my catapult and then move my lancer two spaces and attack over here. Or maybe I have a unit on a control point and I'd like to play a token down to take control with that unit. But you don't really know what you're going to get. And since some of those things you need a specific token for, it may be two or three turns if you've got a whole bunch of stuff in your bag before you are able to get back to that point where you can do the thing you want to do, particularly if you've already had tokens removed because you got injured as a unit. If you're trying to draw the one Lancer token out of your bag, it's less likely you're going to get it if you've got a full bag. I want to echo back to something you talked about, about how the back of the rule book has the chart of the different things you can do. It gives you a list of all the different things you can do face up, face down, so on and so forth. You talked about in a four-player game how there's to be a lot of passing around, and I actually did get a chance to play this four-player at our last game night, and it really was a ton of passing this this uh, booklet around because there's a lot of different things you need to think about, and it's I feel like it's a really hard pickup in a way to remember a lot of those different things the way that you can do so on and so forth action with a face-up or face-down token, which provides a lot of strategy and a lot of depth, but this is game is going to have a heavy pickup for a game that isn't really as complex as it that rule set makes it feel. Well, I don't think that they wanted this game to be the game that you play once every eight months when mm. you feel like bringing it out. First of all, the production and the box of it don't really lend itself to being that every once in a while game like this is a showpiece box it's a big thick box with a magnetic closure it's got a nice tray for Mm -hmm. all the chips to be splayed out in one that doesn't necessarily hold the chips in the most reasonable (laughs) way because they're all the same depth of indentation and you have different number of chips but 
whatever I understand that it makes a lot it makes it a lot easier to produce it if you can just put an even number of chips in each one. Yeah. But I think they wanted this game to be the chess of or a chess style game like where you play it all the time and you get really good at knowing mm-hmm. how to use each unit and when to move a token from your bag to the board and when to just move the unit around and maybe not increase its health until you get it in a point where you want to be able to use it. I feel like this really wants to be a game that somebody figures out how to master. Yeah. And if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for, you know, something like chess to play with somebody who's in your family that you can pull out every night and play a game of chess or every week if you're going to go meet up somewhere and every time you play it, you get a little better at it, you understand it a little better, this is going to work really well for that. Since you need to learn the way that the moves are played out and you need to understand exactly when to move certain tokens from place to place, it's going to be the kind of game that rewards tons and tons of plays. That's not something that we ever really get a chance to do. Mm -hmm. Just because of the way we cycle through games and we have to talk about new games all the time. But if you are somebody who's going to be able to get it played over and over again, I feel like it is going to be really rewarding in the same way that chess is. When you get good at it, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah, I could see it being that style of game. And frankly, I do wish I had more time to sink into War Chest. I have enjoyed the plays that I've had, and I've seen some interesting synergies right past where my level of knowledge is about it currently. But you're right, it's the kind of game that you, if you have the time to dig in and continue to learn more about those pieces, you might find some really interesting strategies. It's not unlike how we talked about Santorini or something like that, whenever that came out a year and a half ago. In that being a game that is abstract strategy with some really interesting powers, and it does it in a new and interesting way. I really like the bag building in this game. I like how tight it is. I like how actively you get to call your pieces. I will say about production, I love the poker chips, and I like the bags, and I like the box and all that. This is one of those games that's produced really well, except for a few weird missteps. The control tokens are poker chip size, but they're cardboard punch out, and our particular copy wasn't very well centered. And then the board, I have never been able to lay this board flat. It's just felt weird to have those kind of production oddities in a game that has such great production on the tokens, the box, the bag, stuff like that. Well, I mean, it's a six-fold board, and when you fold up the six-fold board, it gets pretty well, yeah. you know, folded in on itself. So we've played it, but we have, like I said, we haven't played it a ton and a ton of times. We haven't laid it out mm-hmm. and gotten those seams to really relax. I at first agreed with you on the cardboard tokens. I thought they were weird. I'm like, everything else in this game feels really luxe, but these cardboard tokens don't. Yeah. I agree with you. I wish they were punched evenly so that the they're centered. But I like that they're cardboard because when you place them out onto the board, you can't mistake them for a unit okay. health. Because you have to place a unit onto a control point in order to take control of it. You can't be next to it. You need to be on that space. Mm-hmm. You can at least see when you're looking... Oh, that is a control point and two unit health, Mm. not three unit health, which would have been changed if they were a different color. But then you have to make gold and silver, which are the colors, I think, of the control points. Yeah, they can only make black poker chips this way. And you can tell very easily from the edge what they are, whether they're three health or two health and a control point. Okay, I'll give you that. I honestly would not be surprised if this game does perform well. It is kind of ready for expansion right out the gate. You know, you could easily do another tray of chips or half a tray of chips not with in some that new box, cards. You well, no, you could because there's a giant cardboard insert at the bottom that is really just for spacing. It was in there primarily to raise stuff up because it had the poker chips um, kind of in a in a sleeve, and oh. they were just kind of inset in the bottom. You could easily take that cardboard insert out and have another tray in there. And I honestly kind of wondering if that's why that's designed that way because I could definitely. See See, like a, a game like Tosh Kalar that's had multiple faction packs come out, this would be a really easy thing to add on more content for. And honestly, I would be fine with that. And if you are a player who is into this kind of game and likes to get into it, it could be the kind of thing that breathes even more life into this game. But you have so many different things to start out. I think there's like 20 different unit choices for you to choose from for your particular setup. I don't know. What do you think? This is a game that I can't say I absolutely love, but I knew I wasn't going to when I read the rule book. The first time I read the rule book, which I think I did before you had had a chance to yeah. look at it, I set it up and I played a solo game just to make sure I understood the way the mechanics work. And I immediately looked at it and I was like, I'm going to bounce off of this. It's a good <laughs> game, but I'm going to bounce off of it. This is not the style of game that I love. And if you look at chess and you're like, mm, no then this is probably not going to be the style of game that you're going to love. But if that's the style of game that you are really all about, 
this is a really interesting implementation of it. And I like the way they've done the things that they have done. I do wish that there were a couple of those different things, you know, some player aid cards and some centered control points, but they're relatively small gripes. Other, I mean, those player aid cards would really help, but oh, I'm sure nice. you can print them off BGG at this mm, point. Probably. I haven't checked because, like I said, I'm not interested in playing this every week. But for somebody, this is the game that is going to be the chess in their household that they're going to play with their kids or with their, I mean, heck who, who doesn't have that friend that played chess with their grandparent all the time? (laughs) Like I knew a a person in high school and that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling this game could be that for someone. It's just not that for me. Hmm. Oh yeah. There are definitely a whole bunch of different, uh, player aids available on board game geek. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'll echo that if you enjoyed Santorini and especially if you enjoyed Tosh Kalar, like I felt a lot of Tosh Kalariness on this game. See, I love Tosh Kalar, but Mm -hmm. I, I just didn't get this one. Yeah. Not not get it. I just didn't jive with this one. But if you're big into abstract strategy with some interesting card powers, then war chess is definitely worth a look. I'm excited that we have it, and I would really like to play some more games of this. Hopefully, you know, this is my bring it out at the beginning of game night kind of game when Daniel or somebody shows up early, and we can play a few rounds of it really quickly. It's uh, It plays quickly enough. You know, you could get a game of this done in 20 once you're really getting comfortable with two players. It's totally possible. Or maybe it'll take an hour because both of you get really good at it. I have a feeling that getting really good at it is what's going to make that drafting mechanism that they have included in the rule book at all valuable as well they give you a beginning player setup and i would highly recommend you use that the first time you play it because if you don't know how the units work together you're going to put yourself at a strong disadvantage to somebody who does know how they work together Mm. and i have a feeling once you've played this with that starting setup and maybe switching out one or two units a bunch of times that's when drafting is going to become a really interesting decision to the point where i could see drafting units being sort of almost as important as how you play the game going forward. Cool. Well, War Chest. If you like it, maybe you'll like it. (laughs) That's kind of my gimmick now. I say something weird like that on these um, maybe, you know, for the right kind of people kind of reviews. Yeah. So up next. Oh, yes. Are you ready? I am. Okay. Hey, listeners out there, to pull the the curtain back a little bit, we just got a new recording interface, so I've never done this before, and I want to see what it sounds like, because it is time to go into the Carcassonne! Sounds about the same. Sound good? All right, cool. Well, we have played Carcassonne South Seas, the 2013 release from Z-Man Games. Plays two to five players in 35 minutes, designed by our boy Klaus Jürgen Verda. With art by Harold Lesky, Dennis Lohausen, and Christoph Tisch. This is a game of Carcassonne, but wait, without scoring by feature size. Wait, what? Yeah, for what might be the first time, you are not just completing a feature and then scoring that feature when you do. I'm scared. You are completing features, so don't worry about that. But in Carcassonne South Seas, you are going to start with a central starting tile, and then you are going to draw a tile and place the tile out into the board, connecting features to like features. It is Carcassonne. It is Carcassonne. It will always be Carcassonne. Some of those features will have icons of one of the game's three resources. You have bananas, shells, and fish. Mm -hmm. The traditional three resources. Mm -hmm. When you complete a feature which has any number of bananas, shells, or fish on it, you are going to take those resources. The way features are completed are the bananas are always on sort of forest tiles, so when you complete a forest which is shaped like a city, you are going to get those bananas. The shells are on bridges, bridges, which are roads over water. They're roads. So when you complete a road, you're going to take those shells. The fish are in water, which is the main field mechanism of this game. When you complete a lake area, for lack of a better term, you will get all the fish that are in that lake. But there is a second way to get fish. Some of the water tiles have a fisher boat on them. When you place a fisher boat into a water area that has any kind of fish icons whatsoever, it doesn't have to be a completed water area, you are going to get the number of fish if you have a meeple in that lake. So essentially they work like farmers. You lay them down in the lake and if you complete the lake, you'll get the fish. But if you place a boat into that lake, you will take your meeple back as if it had been completed and you will get the number of fish. Then you will place a fisher boat token over some of the fish icons in that lake area. So it is now worth fewer fish because some have been fished out. Defishing. But 
you can still put a meeple into it if you add to that lake feature on a later round. You can even add more fish to it if you add tiles to that lake feature on a greater later round. Lakes can be fished multiple times with boats, covering some of the fish icons every time, but again, you can still add more to them if you like. This is all well and good, but what do you do with these resources? Eat them. Please don't. They're oh. made of wood. Okay. I mean, two of them are edible, <laughs> but don't eat shells even if they're not made of wood. Anyway, you don't actually get any points for completing features. There is no score track in this game. What there is is a pile of boat tokens, which have different combinations of goods on them. You are going to put out four boat tokens at any given time, and anytime somebody takes one, you'll flip out a new one. And in order to get any points in this game, at the end of your turn, you're going to turn in resources that match the icons on the boat token, and you'll take the boat token, flip it face down in front of you so nobody knows how many points you have, and turn the resources into the, the bank at the end of the game, which is when you run out of either tiles or boat tokens, everybody is going to flip over their boat tokens so they're face up, count up the number of points that are on each token. Boats that require more resources will generally give you more points, whereas, you know, maybe if you turn in just one shell and one banana, you can get two points. Woo. But if you turn in two shells and a fish and two bananas, you're going to get five points. Uh, you're, you'll turn your boats face up, everybody counts up their number of boat points, any remaining resources that you have you will get one point for three resources that you have left. You'll add up all your points, and the person who has the most points has won Carcassonne South Seas. In the Carcassonne. The In Carcassonne. the Carcassonne. I gave you your own echo that time. Oh. So Carcassonne South Seas, I feel like every Carcassonne we talk about, you have the camp of Carcassonne but add something, and what or Carcassonne but something weird. And this is definitely Carcassonne but something weird. I feel like we talked about this with um, the Discovery a long time ago, where it really changes the fundamental way that Carcassonne scores. Honestly, when I opened up the box and I saw that there wasn't a score tracker in there, I honestly thought that there was a piece missing. I thought we had, you know, missed something somehow. WTF, mate. Yeah, it was very confusing. And then I start punching stuff out and I look at the rule book and it doesn't tell me that when I close a city, I get two points per tile. And I was very confused. But this is something very different for Carcassonne. And this was actually the first of the Carcassonne Around the World series. It also includes Gold Rush, we have not covered yet, and Amazonas, which we have covered, and the upcoming Safari, which is not out yet, and therefore we have not covered yet. So it's interesting to see that with these Around the World ones, it looks like they're going a little further away from the system. Obviously, Amazonas had the river that you're going down, and you have the boat, boat scoring, race. the boat race thing. This one also has boats, but they give you fish. I guess it's just a boaty kind of expansion around the world kind of deal. I doubt Gold Rush is <clears throat> going to have too terribly many boats. <laughs> but we've played this with four and with two, and it felt just odd. It felt very odd to the point where I don't know how I feel about this one. Oh, I do. Tell me how you feel about this one. I don't terribly like it. Okay. There is, I feel like, a little bit too much randomness in this game mm. for it to feel good in the way that Carcassonne generally does. When you're playing a game of regular Carcassonne, no matter what tile you draw, even if it's not the tile you wanted, you can do something with it. Mm -hmm. In Carcassonne South Seas, the only way to get points is by fulfilling... I mean, I guess you could just collect an absolute ton of resources and get three or one point per three resources at the end of the game. Yeah, you get something. But you're not going to win if you're not completing any boat tokens. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you're going to end up with all of the boat tokens requiring a specific resource. Uh, the game I'm thinking of required bananas. And, and I think bananas are generally the rare resource in this game, like oh, the one that's yeah. hard to get. Fish are easy to get because you can fish multiple times in the same lake. Mm -hmm the bridges give you shells and generally there's enough bridges going around that you can at least get one or two shells. But bananas, like if you don't have them and you're not drawing jungle tiles, which have bananas on them, you're not going to get them. Yeah. And if you don't get them, you can't score points. That happened to me significantly in the game we were playing earlier today. I had maybe like nine fish and six shells, but I had no bananas. And there are some of those boat tiles that require, you know, random goods. Maybe it's six of anything or three of one, one of another, but those tiles didn't come up and every single tile needed, uh, needed bananas. And I ended up just kind of behind three or four or five tiles by the end of the game, simply because they just randomly never came up. That's really annoying. 
Yeah, especially in a higher player count game where you're seeing fewer of the tiles, mm -hmm. the fact that you need specific things and you just might not get them does not feel rewarding to me in the way that Carcassonne generally does. You know, I could be building a city and maybe I don't get city tiles, so I can't make that worth a whole ton of points. But if I'm not getting city tiles in regular Carcassonne, I'm either getting road tiles or I'm getting field tiles. And I can put a farmer down and get points for that field tile, maybe. Or I can put a, a thief. Is that a thief down in Carcassonne? Yeah, technically. A road a, guy a down thief. in Carcassonne. <laughs> road man. And I'll get points that way. It's not what I wanted, but it's something. Yeah. Here, if you're playing a four-player game, you need one of the resources... You could never get that resource and not be able to get points. Or maybe a boat comes up that doesn't require that resource, but it comes up when your turn has just passed. Yeah. Maybe you, the person after you buys a tile. Then there's two more players to go before it even gets to you. And if you have the resources, maybe one of them buys it. Mm -hmm. And then you can't get points again. So in a two-player game, it feels a little bit better because you see half of the tiles. That gives you a greater chance to get things. But in a four-player game, it just I felt sort of helpless about getting resources and getting points. Mm -hmm. I don't like that in my Carcassonne. Mm -hmm. I feel that Carcassonne South Seas would be an easy game to teach to people who have not played Carcassonne. But if you are a regular Carcassonne player or have played you know, base Carcassonne and maybe one or two spinoffs or expansions, it's going to be weird getting your brain off of make big features and then complete them eventually. Because you want to be completing features so often to be getting those goods. And it seems like it just seems weird for the reasons that Carcassonne is fun. Carcassonne is fun when you make giant cities or when you're passive aggressively elbowing into somebody else's farm or something like that. Or you got the road to nowhere going on and that kind of stuff is exciting. But if you have a road to nowhere or a bridge to nowhere and it's just it's got six or seven shells on it, you'll get those six or seven shells at the end of the game, but you don't get any worthwhile points with you them. You get two points for yeah. that. That's not not worth it. So, not in a game where in a two-player game you can get between 30 and like 50-something points. <laughs> like two points does not help you in that case. No, not at all. So I don't know. It is interesting. I feel it is worth playing if you are a Carcassonne fanatic. But this is one that's going to rate near the bottom of my Carcassonne zones. Car yeah. Car Carcassonne is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the only benefit is that you can... Multiple, you can fish a lake multiple times. I mm -hmm. feel like that's interesting that they've added because that means that you can never just squat on something and get those points at the end of the game. I mean, you will get the points at the end of the game because you, you do score few. out your features, but not in the same way that like farmers can absolutely just destroy at the end when you're doing scoring. You get to get multiple value out of those lakes, but if you're not adding to them, they will become less and less valuable. So you need to be contributing as well as withdrawing. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But I don't think that that mechanic makes up for the randomness that comes from the random boat tiles along with the random terrain tiles. Yeah. Before we leave the Carcassonne, do you want to talk about the art a little bit? It's fine. It's the fine. monkey has the weirdest face on the front of the box. Yeah, the box cover is one of these. Don't look at, at it too closely because it seems good from a distance. And then you look at the detail and the monkey looks like Homer Simpson. And he's got like the Homer Simpson mouth kind of look to yeah, it's him. It's a human face on it, a monkey. And why it, does a monkey have a human face? I don't know. I don't know. But production-wise, it's nice. The tiles are definitely a nice kind of refreshing look in that there's not just fields everywhere. The ocean's got, you know, nice color to it. The bridges, everything's very colorful in this game. And the wooden tokens. Oh, yeah, I guess we should say about the wooden tokens. The There is a, a one token and a three token for each of the goods. And the goods, or the three size goods, are just bigger. They're slightly bigger. So if somebody across from you has two big bananas and you have no frame of reference for that, it might just look like two regular bananas and they've actually got six over there and they snatch that tile out from under you. That is kind of annoying. You know, I would have loved to have a, a different piece of shape, maybe like a three bunch banana or like a pair of fish or something like that. But I don't know. I mean, it's we're, we're so going into the nitpicky stuff on this. That's this not point. nitpicky though. Like yeah. since the only way to get points in this game is by turning in mm. resources. If you think somebody can't complete a boat and you let it go around, because you can only claim one boat at the end of each turn. Mm. So say you can claim two boats because you think that this one will still be here. The other player can't claim it because they don't have enough resources. And then it turns out that they do have way more of a resource than you think. That can be a problem, and it can really put a, a hitch in your game. Or 
what had happened a couple of times in our four-player game, somebody picks up the wrong resource and thinks they have either fewer or more of a resource than they should because, you know, they, they're not that different in size. They are a little bit thicker and a little bit bigger, but particularly the, the bananas, because the, the shells were pretty easy to tell apart mm. um, if you had them together, which if there's no frame of reference, it's not. But yeah. the fish were a little bit more difficult. But the bananas were very difficult to tell apart, especially since the edges of some of the smaller bananas were chipped and some of the large, like, it it was not a great component choice. They should have been either different colors or marked in some way or different shapes. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it, like, make make good pieces. Yeah. I would just say South Seas was commendable for them trying something different. It didn't work out super well. If you're a Carcassonne fanatic like I am, it's worth playing. But you probably don't need to hold on to this one forever. No. All right. Daniel, you want to take us out of the Carcassonne? What, like on a ferry? Do I get to take fish with me? <laughs> Do I get to take less fish than the last time I took the ferry? Well, actually, ferries are one of the mini expansions. We will cover that at some point next year. Because, yes, you thought you were done with Carcassonne expansions, but there's all those tiny little boxes. I never boxes. think I'm done with Carcassonne expansions, we'll but there's ferries in there? Yeah, they're, one of them is the ferries, and we got the flying machines, and there's one like Gold Bricks, which is weird because it's not Gold Rush, but there's another... Look, what I was saying is that there's a lot more in the Carcassonne for 2019. So get your t-shirt now. Yeah. In City of Gears from Grey Fox Games, you'll be exploring and exploiting new locations to further your own interests, while using your power to make sure your foes can't do the same. Players will discover and complete buildings in the previously unfinished steam-powered city and make connections to refine their game engine by chaining actions and gaining extra abilities. Be careful, though, because other players can spend electricity to knock your worker out of a location and destroy the connections you've made. Whichever player has managed to gain the most prestige restoring the city by opening day will be known as the founder of the City of Gears. Check it out at your game store of choice or on greyfoxgames.com. And if you're coming to PAX Unplugged, check out Grey Fox Games at booth 1913 to see City of Gears in person. Grey Fox Games. Quality games. Cleverly crafted. So our six-pack review this week is for Pasaraya Supermarket Manager, which is a 2018 release from Box Fox Games. It plays one to four players in 60 to 90 minutes. The designer is Sehui Leong, or Felix Leong, and the artist is Meow God, which I can totally get behind. <laughs> this is a game of deck building, order fulfillment, and unlearning what you know about deck builders. Oh boy. So, Passaraya Supermarket Manager, on its surface, operates a lot like you expect from deck builders. You have a discard pile, you have a draw pile. You're going to get cards and put them into your discard pile, and then on your turn, you're going to draw some out of your draw pile that will be your hand that you use in that particular turn of the game. Where Passaraya digresses from most deck builders is that when you spend the money, instead of it going into your discard pile, the money goes away. What a novel concept. When you spend money, it goes away. I think we've harped on how novel, <laughs> and novel is in air quotes here, but this is before, in uh, episode two, two or three episodes ago. And also when we've talked, if you've seen me talk on Gumbo Live or Game All Night about Passaraya, I've brought up how novel this is in a way. Same thing, when you use your goods cards to fulfill orders in the market, those goods will go away. It's important to kind of get those ideas in your head early on, because this is in opposition to a lot of deck builders. When you have money or goods that cycle through, they continue to cycle through your deck, meaning that your deck will eventually become big and bloated unless you have a culling mechanic. So I want to get that idea in your head early on. So as we talk about this game, it'll make sense the way that the flow is going to work. You got your resource management in my deck builder. Well, you got your deck builder in my resource management. Indeed. Anyway, in addition to the standard draw pile and the discard pile, aka warehouse, you have two other areas in your player mat that are kind of important. You have the supermarket, which is everything above the top of your player mat, which is where you will store goods that you have for display that you can eventually, you know, sell to fulfill contracts. And you can also put some of these employee cards for standby. I'll talk about all that in a little bit. But basically, you can stock up cards there to take actions on later turns. You 
you also, on the bottom left of your player mat, have a bank. And this is really important and one of the most interesting things about the game. Anytime you fulfill an order card using some of your goods, you're going to get money for it, which is good because you need money to obviously buy more goods and services. But the money will go directly into your bank, and you are controlling when the money moves from your bank into your discard pile. You are actively managing how big your deck will be at any given time. It's culling built into the mechanics of the game, and it's I don't want to spoil the review of the game, that I won't talk about that in a little while. So, in the central area between all players, you have the four... The you have the three basic goods. You have food for one coin, you have clothes for two coins, and you have appliances for three coins. You also have four different worker cards that each have two kinds of workers on them. Uh, there's a supervisor that when you play this card, you allow you kind of churn through your cards faster. There's an accountant that allows you to convert one money cards into three money cards so you can draw more money on a particular turn. You have a recruiter that allows you to hire people cheaper and also you know have the ability to put them directly onto the top of your deck if you wish. You have a worker that allows you to move goods that you've just purchased and is in your discard pile up to your supermarket up top so you can use them quicker. You have a buyer that can buy goods cheaper, which is fantastic and allows you to, you know, work with those cards in an interesting way. And you also have this thief and security kind of card that you are able to steal from other players, get some of their cards that way. But frankly, in games we've played, this card has come out literally once. So I'm going to kind of gloss over that particular feature. I'll talk about that later. You also have a junior salesperson you start with, and the bottom half of one of the cards is also a salesperson, and this will allow you to take the goods that are in your warehouse and fulfill these sales orders cards that are up at the top of the common area. And these require a specific number of food, clothes, or appliances. And you do those, you'll get that card, it will go into your discard pile, more on that later, and you'll get the money that will go directly into your bank. These sales cards, once they cycle through into your hand, are going to impact the game in interesting ways. A large number of them will attach onto the back of existing sales requests and increase or decrease the requirements of those cards. Maybe this 010 will become a 011 because it needs an additional appliance now. It also changes the payout of that card once you fulfill that order. Really cool. Some of them also come through and have one-time effects, like there's one that says anybody can sell food out of their warehouse or their supermarket for a valuable, you know, a higher price, maybe four bucks instead of two bucks, which is cool. And those cards will kind of get used once and they go out. There's also one card that will cycle back into that order area. So you can kind of plan for it on a future turn if you think that you are going to be able to get that one again as it comes around. Kind of nice. Finally, you will have a set of cards that are the current prices, and this is going to be the same deck you're drawing more sales forecasts out of. Every now and then you'll flip up a current prices card that will sit above the sales forecast, and it will tell you the going rate for each of your three goods if you just sell them straight up by using a salesperson and not using them to fulfill an order. It's a, a marginal increase over their buying price, so if you want to make a little extra cash, you can do that. Those cards also have interesting one-time powers. Maybe all food orders are now worth an extra dollar, or maybe every Everybody gets taxed and has to discard $1 per 10 bucks in their bank. So interesting stuff that's going to change your gameplay depending on how that deck is set up. You only use a few of them in every game, and I think there's like 30 or so of those current prices cards that could come up. That deck of cards of the sales orders and the current prices will also have the timer of the game built in. There will be a point in the deck when you do during setup. About two-thirds of the way through that deck, you will flip out a fiscal reporting card, and that will signify either the final round or that you will have one more round after this round completes. So after that, you're going to hopefully sell your goods however you can, and then once we have hit the end of the game, you're going to count up all of your money in the bank, and then add in the raw cost of any goods you have left in your warehouse or supermarket. And money and goods is your score at the end of the game. This is a game about money, and having those worker cards are just going to be extra cards by the end of the game. So I guess that's the moral of the story. Money is capitalism or something. You should make money when running a supermarket <laughs> is the moral of the story. Moral of the story. If you are running a supermarket, you want to make money. Yeah. So that is Passaraya. I will say, for the purposes of this review, we are only talking about the base game. There is a solo rule set included, and there is also a set of alternate employee cards that you will kind of use with a different rule set to remove some of your innate actions. Like in the game we're going to talk about, you always have the option to purchase goods at their base rate for whatever. The employee driven mode requires employee cards for pretty much all the actions you're going to take, so you end up using those cards a lot more, and it changes the way that that game is going to work. We're only going to talk about the base game where you have some innate abilities, and you are also going to use those employee cards as you do. 
So I want to start off with a little bit of background on this game. This is not the kind of game you're going to be able to go down to your local game store and grab right now. This is a game that is only available directly from the designer. I happen to have a gameplay of this with... Um, Eric Yurko from What's Eric Playing at Gen Con this year it was the very first game that I played, and I purchased a copy direct from the designer then. So, uh, Sei Hui Long is a Malaysian designer, and you can get it directly from him. I think it's 49 bucks shipping included from Malaysia, which for a box of pretty dense cards is pretty good. I mean, all in, in my opinion, I think it was a fair deal. Yeah. It is a little bit more than you might generally play for, pay for a box of cards, but again, that shipping is included, and these cards are really just very nice thick cards. Mm -hmm. The art on it is, well, I think it's nice. I think it's fun yeah. and cute. If you are a very anti-cartoonish art, if you don't like <laughs> chibi-style art, which this isn't chibi-style, but it is close to chibi-style. Yeah, it's style. like Funko Pop kind of looking people. Yeah, pretty much. If that's not your bag, you may not love it, but I think it's very cute. But... One of the reasons that I have been pushing to do a full featured review on this for a long time is that this is a self-published game from a Malaysian designer who's not going to have a lot of marketing machine behind them. And I, like, to spoil the end of it, I love this game. This is one of my very favorite games of the year, and I love the fact that it came from a place that you wouldn't usually look for a game. As I understand it, there's maybe like 150 copies that have been sold so far, and if I inspire... 10 of you out there to contact and order a copy of this game, then I feel like it was 100% worth it to talk about this game today. But let's talk about the game itself. Like you said, art kind of cartoony. That's one thing that I've noticed whenever we've had this at game days is that people always want to come by and take a look at this. The box is your typical kind of long card box, but it's got such bright, colorful art on it. And the side panel is really eye-catching as well. You know, not only the side panel, but the top of it, the whole box is made to look like a carton. Well, I, I assume it to be a carton of milk. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they sell many other things in that carton shape. But if you've ever seen a, ca a carton of Parmalat, mm. uh, it's about that shape. And But it is it is shaped like a, like a liquid <laughs> containment device. There's a little cap drawn on the top of it. And the side panel has what is supposed to look like nutrition facts, but it's actually... Just uh, references, for, I think, for the rule book where you can find information in the rule book. It talks about the components and stuff as well. Okay, so yeah. yeah, it is just information about the game, but it looks like a little carton of liquid. Yeah. And I think it's very cute. <laughs> and like I said, the art's really eye catching, and you're going to be laying out a good bit of cards on the table, so you get to really kind of enjoy it. I like the player mats, they're not huge, they're not, you know, giant player mats. They're a nice size card that will fit into the box, and it will give you space to have each of your different areas, especially once you get a feel for how your player mat is going to be set up. And they're double-sided. One side lists all of the potential actions that you can take in your draw pile section, and the other side doesn't. So if you've played the game a couple of times, you don't need the actions that are available listed out for you. You can play with that side face up that doesn't have any of the actions listed. But if you do have a new player, you have a player aid card that's not an additional card. It's right part of their player mat. Mm -hmm. There are a few interesting things you got to pay attention to as well. The cards aren't rotatable in a way. Like it's, you know, there's obviously on the back of the card, there's a face up and a face down. And if you're looking at the front of the card and you have, I think the money cards, for example, the meal cards, if they, you have them upside down in your hand, it'll be a dead giveaway that you have meal. But if somebody else is staring at your hand that closely to see how much money you have, like, yeah, if you have the meal upside down, the back of the card will be upside down. And do you not leave other cards upside down in your hand? <laughs> no, I do not. I, I don't upright my goods okay. when I'm playing. Like, I know that the food is food, whether yeah. it's right side up or upside down. Mm -hmm. I will say the cards were a little sticky, not like icky sticky, but they're, you know, kind of stuck together. It's not like the smoothest finish in the world on them. But after a handful of plays of this, everything loosened up pretty good, and we're playing it just like any other normal card game. But I guess where I want to start with talking about gameplay is the learning curve on this game. When I first played this, and Eric Yurko taught it to me at Gen Con, it took me about half a game to understand the way that it works. And this is the thing that I find most interesting about this. I've talked about this at length on other people's shows whenever we've talked about this game, but it's interesting to see a deck builder that has removed a level of abstraction. It works like you expect it to work. When you spend money or send out goods, they go away. And it's interesting to me and kind of exciting in a way that 
we have to remind people that's how economy works, because it's something you don't usually expect in a card game. You know, this is my water flows downhill moment of the episode that I always talk about. When you spend goods, they go away. What a surprise. That's how economy works. But to untrain your mind, if you have played a lot of deck builders, your star realms, your legendaries, stuff like that, to untrain your mind that your cards will always stay in your hand, it takes a minute. And that's kind of exciting for me and what I really enjoyed about my first play of the game. In addition to that mechanic being really novel, I really liked the way that you control how money gets placed into your deck. At the end of your turn, you can decide to move any amount of money you like in single unit meal cards Mm -hmm. into your discard pile so that when you recycle, it will be there for you to purchase goods or to hire people. There's two important things about that. You need to monitor the rate at which you move things so that you don't dilute your deck really, really weakly so that, you you know, you're going to be drawing a handful of all one meal cards, which is not going to allow you to do a whole ton of things. You want to be drawing a mix of workers to lay out and goods and also cards that are going to allow you to buy and to hire. But also it means that as you move that money from your bank, you are giving away points. Mm -hmm. You need to spend points to make points in this game. And you control the rate at which you do that. Something that I have found really interesting about that deck control mechanic is how differently different players have approached this. I've had games where I've had maybe 20 or so cards that I'm cycling through my deck because I've purchased so many employees and I'm bringing in more money. And as I've gone further with more plays in the game, I'm finding the balance of that a lot more effective. So I can, you know, have maybe like eight or nine cards that I'm cycling through. And I have a really good idea for what's going to be in my hand. One thing that really amazed me when we were playing this, we were playing this with Matt Wolf up at the Gamers for Cures marathon. The entire game, he only ever had five cards in his card cycle at any given time. So he knew exactly what he would have. And it's cool in a way to see a game that allows you that much freedom to control the size of your deck. One of the biggest complaints I hear about deck builders is, oh, I wish this had a culling mechanic, or man, I wish I could get rid of this junk cards quicker. I think Star Realms did a really good job with that in that a quarter of the cards, the red faction, are really focused on culling. But I hear this a lot in other deck builders like uh, the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle apparently didn't have any culling early on. And I know Clank, while deck building is just an element of that, There's not a lot of culling available in that. And this is a game that really is focused on you controlling your deck so you know exactly what you're going to have come up so you can be as efficient as possible with those cards. Well, I mean, I feel like that adds to the thematic nature of this deck builder because Mm -hmm. if you are running a business, you control how much money is being put into your hiring. You control how much money is being put into your overhead, which is essentially what buying goods into, into your supermarket is or into your discard pile Mm -hmm. to be put into your supermarket, you make those decisions. You decide who you're going to hire. And, you know, if you can maybe find a way to negotiate that, you know, in this case, it's using a recruiter to negotiate that at a lower price and hire them at a lower price. You make the decision what you're going to stock in your store. And it definitely feels like you are in control of your little business as you go. You decide whether you're going to just sell the goods to turn them over, or if you're going to save them to fulfill a certain sales forecast up at the top. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that doesn't feel super thematic to me is the idea that you can change what the market is asking for. I guess it's like a counter marketing campaign from a thematic (laughs) standpoint, but the idea that when you get those sales forecast cards back into your hand and you can place them to alter the conditions that are being requested, it it does feel a little bit like negotiating with your customer, which doesn't feel super (laughs) thematic to me. That may just be because I'm used to going into, you know, a store and what it's marked is what you pay. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like coupons or something. I don't know. Yeah. But that is the only thing that doesn't feel really thematic to me, that altering of expectation. Everything else feels like I am running a business and I'm in control of how the money moves and how the employees and goods are are used within that business. Mm -hmm. As somebody who's worked in retail and food service for a very long time, I really want to echo that. So much about this game feels thematic. I feel like I'm controlling costs like I do in the restaurant business. You know, you're hiring only exactly the people you need, and some of those people are going to have two jobs. And that felt right. You know, it feels right to me that the supervisor and the accountant are the same person. This is a small family establishment. Of course, that person's going to be doing two things. That's what they have to do to manage their costs and get by. And I just, I love the 
thematic feel of a lot of these cards. Well, now, I feel like based on the art, they are supposed to be two different people. Very true, very true. Each card has two very different <laughs> illustrations on it, so... And then you you have the thief in security. Obviously, your security guard isn't stealing from the rival establishment. Uh, maybe. Maybe not, obviously. Maybe it does happen. I don't know. Um, I will say, and I feel like this is a good time to talk about the thief and the security thing. So it has this card, the thief and security. The thief, when you play it, you can steal from somebody's supermarket a card or a card from their hand, I think it is, or maybe the warehouse. And then security means that they have to play two thief cards to, you know, do that thing. You need to play more thief cards than the other person has security yeah. cards in play. And once you use a thief, the card goes away. So it's a one-time use thing. Frankly, I find these cards completely unnecessary. And like I said, in the six games that we've played, I've seen it work exactly once. Well, I mean, th that, to be fair, says more about the way we play games than it does about the actual mechanic yeah. of the game. If it weren't in there, somebody would be bummed out that there's not player interaction, and you know it. True. We don't generally play these kind of engine building games with a ton of player interaction because it feels better to us to get the engine running and get the deck tightly controlled and make sure that everything is operating exactly the way we want it to, and that's the part that feels good. There are people who really enjoy interaction between their players, and I think this is a good way for that to be done because not only are you deciding when there's interaction because if you see somebody buy a thief card you can just buy a security guard and put it there yeah and you'll you'll be safe but you also are deciding how much of your points are you willing to invest in this one one upping of the other player because hiring those people costs money so you need to give away your points again in order to be able to have that interaction and i think it's an interesting addition to the balancing act that they're doing as opposed to just like letting you somehow mess with other players. Okay, I definitely can see that, and I'm I'm on board with that. It could also be the fact that every time I teach this game, I mention to everybody, here's this card, I've never used it, you don't have to use this card. So I generally kind of push people away from using it. Yeah. I want to have more fun doing the engine and the, the order management stuff. I mean, that's just exciting to me. I understand that, but you are definitely coloring <laughs> the way people are playing this game. Yes. I'm fine with it because I agree with you, but... You know, it, it would definitely be a different issue if you didn't mention it that way. But again, I think it's it's just a matter of how you play mm -hmm. this type of game. So this game generally plays two to four players, which is pretty typical for a lot of games like this. I've played every player count possible. And honestly, this is a, a two or three kind of deal for me. I like three because you get more moving pieces. But I will say with four, you are going to get the, the downtime you expect. You're only playing a quarter of the time of the game. And it has pretty generally played in about an hour, no matter what the player count, which is nice. So I feel like I've always got the same amount of game. But at a four player game, you're definitely going to be, you know, once it's the next player's turn, you're just going to draw your five cards and kind of look at the board. You can't really be 100% certain you're going to get any of those sales forecasts so you might as well just you know sit back for a second and just enjoy some of the fun art i do want to go back to something i was talking about earlier when we were talking about carcassonne south seas okay because in that game you have a similar kind of point scoring mechanism where you need to have certain types of resources in order to fulfill the main point getting mechanism of the game in this case it's the sales forecast in that game it's those boats that give you points yeah so you need to have those resources and you can't really control what's coming out i mean there is a little bit of a shift i think the later game cards the year two cards have a little bit more of the more expensive goods on them as opposed to the earlier cards having more of the food which is the cheapest resource but you can't really control them in any way other than to just wait for something to come out mm -hmm. but because in this game, what you can get is not random, it doesn't feel as restrictive as it does in Carcassonne South Seas. Yeah. In that game, I was talking about there being too many random elements. But in this game, you control what inventory you buy. So you may not always have the right inventory, but you can get it whenever you need it. It's just a matter of how much money you put into your deck to be able to buy the resources that you need. And because of that, the random sales requirements don't feel as hindering as they do in that game. And I wanted to make that clarification because I know like 20 minutes ago I was complaining about this type of thing. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, it's fine. But it's because you control what you get in this game. There's never like a point where you can't buy a food if you've got money in your deck. And there's always a point where you can get money in your deck if you have money in your bank and you start with some. 
Yeah, and it really loops back to the central thing that I love about this game. This game is all about controlling what you have in your deck so that you can use exactly what you need to get that particular order fulfilled. This is a game about controlling your resources tighter than any deck builder lets you do this. And if you are a fan of deck builders, if you like the mechanic of adding things to your deck and then cycling through them, but you want to be able to control it more, this is a no-brainer of a game that I think people would want to take a next step to. All right, so Danielle, final thoughts? All in all, I really like the way this game controls a good number of things. There's not an unlimited number of options at any point in the game. There's only ever three resources, and there's only ever four types of workers that you can purchase into your deck. I like the fact that it is all about taking those seven cards that are always going to be available to you and purchasing them in the right combination, playing them out in the right way, having the right employees prepped to do their job so that you can fulfill things when they come out. This is all about making smart choices with the seven cards that you are given that you can use. And I really like that. I like the fact that your deck is constantly going to be changing based on how you use it. And I like the fact that while this game is not super interactive, it could have an ability to be interactive between the players. There's really very little I don't like about this game, other than, like we had said, a little bit of, like, tackiness to the cards, which I'd rather they be thick cards that are a little bit tacky than thin cards that bend and tear and get marked easily. Mm -hmm. I like the fun, bright art. I like the illustration on it. I really just like this game. I wouldn't necessarily bring it out if you have somebody who wants their deck to work for them without having to interact with it. Because so many deck builders are about buying the right things and then just running that engine, this game you are perpetually managing. And I think that's fun, but if you want to get to a point where your engine is just running for you, this is going to feel like you're constantly involved in it and constantly making that deck work but I think that's what's good about it. I think my final thoughts are pretty clear. I love Pasaraya. I think it's a fantastic game that does something interesting and novel with deck building. It allows you to control your card management better than anything else in the space. It's got great art, and at three or four players, it still plays in that advertised hour that plays in a perfect amount of time. You don't. It doesn't outstay its welcome. I feel like there's enough variability in terms of the cards that are going to come out for the sales forecast and also the current prices that you'll have a different experience each time. But there's not so many pieces that the game is going to be a bear to learn. The hardest thing about playing Passaraya is breaking your mind of the things that you knew about deck builders. And like I said at the top of the episode, if I can get 10 people to buy this game, then I feel like I've done my job here as a board game podcaster. So yeah, go check it out. We'll put a link in the show notes so you can find out how you can get a copy of Passaraya if you would like to. And if you do play it, or if you have played it, go give it some ratings on BGG, because as of yet, it doesn't have enough ratings to be ranked. Because, yeah, I mean, this is only 150 or so copies out there in the world. Let's see if we can get it to 200. Why not? Why not? All right, well, we're going to take a quick break and come back with the on tap, because we've got some fun supermarket-related beers. For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. So since Pasaraya is a supermarket manager game, I thought this was a really good time to highlight supermarkets that actually have their own beers that they sell. Nice. They don't all always brew them themselves, which you're going to see in two of the three supermarket beers that we're going to be talking about. They are brewed via breweries that work in collaboration with the supermarkets. But I think it's interesting to highlight stores that are actually making something new that they can sell in their space. And it's a really good option for somebody who's looking for something a little bit different, but who's not really willing to go to, you know, your local bottle shop at this point. That's a different stop. There are lots of very busy people. There are lots of people who are not willing to make that commitment yet. But if you can get something more interesting than a Bud Light in your supermarket, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about it. Cool. I dig it. So, from Whole Foods Brewing Company, based out of Houston, Texas, we have the DL Double IPA. It is a double IPA at 8.2% ABV and 84 IBU. This is obviously for Whole Foods Market, which is, I guess, a nationwide chain. Yeah, Whole Foods Market. They're pretty much everywhere now. It's a nationwide chain. Amazon Uh, owns them, so (laughs) they're everywhere. Very true. So, there's a juicy hop flavor with enough bitterness to keep it refreshing and a citrusy aroma jumping out of the glass. 
When you say that Whole Foods Brewing Company is in Houston, Texas, they're actually in a Whole Foods in Houston, Texas. I'm pretty sure they they're at the. Oh wow! Well, they don't brew in the supermarket. They brew in a building oh, okay. in there. But they are, there's a little pub in the supermarket. Oh, that's so cool. Next up from Unibrew in Chambly, Quebec, Canada, we have Providential Belden Style Golden Ale. This is a golden ale that is brewed for Trader Joe's. And frankly, I really should be putting vintage 2018 from Unibrew that is sold at Trader <laughs> Joe's on this list because it comes out like this week. It's in their Fearless Flyer circular this week. But we used it in episode 84 for the ultimate Karka zone. So I didn't want to double up because that's cheating. Mm-hmm. I try not to do that. So I am – I'm – officially using providential belton style golden ale which is also very good and if you can get a chance to try it it is a golden ale with pear aromas and citrusy and peppery flavor notes it's highly carbonated and available in bombers it's very good but right now if you're looking for the thing that is just (laughs) in trader joe's it's vintage 2018 but we can't use that twice yes we have a strict policy here on the on tap i made a rule yes So Aldi UK has a beer that they brew with Brains Craft Brewery in Cardiff, Wales. It is Spill the Beans, and it is a coffee porter that clocks in at 4.4% ABV. This porter has a multi-rich chocolate taste with an aroma of caramel and some sweet malt, and it's available in 12-ounce bottles. Yeah, I went with an Aldi UK on this one, not just because I wanted to be global, but because the brews that Aldi has brewed for their U.S. branches (laughs) were rated less well they do do some beers for their all the u.s franchise and i'm hopeful that going forward maybe they will work with some other breweries and you know get a a more well-received beer brewed for the u.s brands but the uk one had a whole bunch of beers that were above the threshold i generally consider uh when I'm, i'm looking at ratings of beers i pull this list off untapped to pull back the curtain a little bit I don't really consider beers that are less than 3.5 out of 5 on a rating scale. I consider it to be, like, I don't want to tell you guys to go drink beer that you're not going to (laughs) like. So the U.S. ones were all below that threshold, so I didn't even consider them. But the U.K. ones had a whole bunch of beers that were well above that threshold because they're working with really good breweries like Brains in Cardiff. So good for them. I hope Aldi brings that practice across to the U.S. soon. Cool. And finally? And finally, our fourth beer is not a supermarket beer, but the name will explain why it's on this list, and I absolutely loved it, and I know I'm never going to be able to use it otherwise. It is from Stickman Brews in Royersford, Pennsylvania, and it is store-bought is fine. That's a double IPA, and it is 8% ABV. It is a full-body double IPA with pineapple notes and a juicy flavor profile. And their tagline for this beer, which if you've ever heard anything from Ina Garten, who is a television chef and writes a ton of cookbooks uh their tagline for the beer is if you can't brew southeastern pennsylvania's best double ipa at home store-bought is fine (laughs) this is available in cans also so go out and give it a try they have two uh poor house locations in pennsylvania and it looked like these like i said they were available in cans so you could get it to go and there's a little bit of distro on that. Cool. Well, for more information on those beers, you can hit up the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. And Danielle, it's getting cold outside, and you had an appropriate beer segment for us. I realized we had never done a beer primer on winter warmers. I had talked about sort of old ales and that style of English ale before, but we've never talked about winter warmers. And I thought it was about time because they're starting to come out, and this is uh, this is when you're going to want to know what they are as this it gets is cool. Well, not quite yet, but... Yeah. (laughs) Winter warmers have their roots in English strong and old ales, most most notably the Burton Ale. They are stronger in ABV than the rest of the beers that a brewery will generally brew. Well, when I say that, I mean they're stronger in ABV than anything other than, like, your crazy bourbon barrel double stouts or whatever. You know, they're they're obviously breweries like Dogfish Head are going to be brewing stuff that's... 15, 16, 18%. But winter warmers are going to be stronger in ABV than most of your general offerings. They are 55 to 8% generally, but they can go much stronger in... I'm looking at you, Carton. Carton makes a decoy winter warmer, which is 12%. Oof. Which is just... That, that is... That is one big bottle. Very strong. It's, yeah. it's also very good, I but... Doubt it. <laughs> um, it, it is generally in the 55 to 8% range. They are predominantly malty in flavor, 
And there may be some hop flavor in the nose, and particularly in an American winter warmer, you may get some hop flavor in the nose because we Americans, have to hop everything. we do like to hop things. But if you get hops at all, they're going to be really well balanced and they're never going to overpower the sweet malty flavor that is the focus of these beers. Like you pick up a winter warmer, it should be a malt bomb in your mouth. Hmm. That is on purpose. The color can range anywhere from a red color to a dark, dark black color. And that's because you're putting a ton of malt in it. That good, good malt is going to give you a lot of good, good color. If you have these, they're going to have a toffee flavor or sometimes a dark fruit flavor to them. Not as an additive necessarily, although you can add fruit to a winter warmer. But it, that's just the flavor that you're going to get off anything that's that style of multi dark. Like you think about like a Belgian double that's also going to have those darker fruit flavors or an old ale will have that as well. They can be spiced, but they don't have to be. If they are spiced, the English versions of these are generally going to be much more reserved in how they're spiced, while the Americans, who've already dumped a whole bunch of extra <laughs> hops in them, are more likely to aggressively or eclectically spice these. When you talk about like American winter warmers, that's when the distinction between Christmas ales and winter warmers sort of gets blurred a little bit. A lot of times, especially when you're looking at either beer judging, where they're grouped into categories, or when you're just talking about articles about history... Christmas ales and winter warmers are grouped together because they're brewed at the same time of year and they're similar styles of beer. Theoretically, Christmas ales should be the significantly more spiced of the two, but a lot of American winter warmers and even some English winter warmers are putting spice into a winter warmer so you get something that's sort of a hybrid. Generally, you shouldn't have as much spice in a winter warmer as a Christmas, but, you know, sometimes you do. <laughs> I don't know if I said it at the beginning, but the idea of why it is called the winter warmer is because when you're in a cold climate, drinking something that's higher in alcohol content is going to warm your belly. I mean, it's the same reason why the Russians make vodka, because it is warming to them and they live in a really, really cold place. Mm. And, you know, you get Scottish alcohols, you get like whiskeys or scotch. You're, you're going to drink that and it will keep you warm in cold climates. But this idea is that, you know, you're drinking an English ale. You're still getting your English ale because you're English, theoretically, when these were started. And you'd like to have something to drink. Mm -hmm. But it is higher in alcohol content, so you're going to brew it in the colder time of year. The other thing about that is when you increase the alcohol percentage of a beer, it is more shelf-stable. It'll last longer. This is sort of evidenced by the fact that when we talk about aging stuff... We say if it's over 10%, you can probably keep it for a little while. You know, an, an IPA is always going to be less able to age than something that is more malt-based, but something that is higher in alcohol content is more likely to age well. Well, these beers were brewed in the fall and going into the winter because that's when they had the grain available, and they had to last a little bit longer through the winter, so the higher alcohol content helped there as well. If you are looking for a recommendation on some winter warmers, I mean, you will obviously get some stuff from England. You'll get your Sam Smith Winter Welcome. Oh, yeah. That, that, that one was always my favorite. Yeah, I actually wanted to make a different recommendation from our neck of the woods. Okay. Highland Cold Mountain just came out. Oh, yeah. And Highland Cold Mountain is in a very good winter warmer. They've got an imperial version of it, which I imagine probably comes in a little closer to that carton decoy I was talking about mm. before. Also, that carton decoy is pretty good, but I don't think it's out yet. But if you can have a chance to get Cold Mountain, they distribute it pretty well around this area. I'm not sure how far it gets, but it is a really good one. I also love Full Steam First Frost, which is a winter warmer with persimmon. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you can put fruit in it. It's just not necessary. I found a First Frost that we had in our carefully uh, managed, <laughs> carefully managed inventory, inventory. <laughs> and I threw it in the fridge. I'm very excited to drink it later in the week. So that'll be a good fun time. But if you are feeling a little chilly and you might need something to, to warm you up, mm -hmm. be it spiced or less spiced, a winter warmer may be exactly the beer you're looking for. I know. I am excited to get my first Sam Smith Winter Welcome of the Year. Mm -hmm. Well, good stuff. Danielle, you'll put some links to stuff in the show notes like you do? So many links. So much stuff. Cool. Well, it is time for us to move on to the final round. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. All right, well, it is time for the final round. And considering we talked about a deck builder and we've also talked about a bag builder, it seemed perfectly natural for me to go with the following topic. Are deck builders your thing? Do you dig it more as a simple deck builder, Dominion or Star Realms, or one that uses deck building as a part to a whole, Clank, for example? 
Sub-question to this, how critical is culling to your deck building experience? Build us an opinion. So all these responses are coming from the Draft Mechanic Slack channel, which you can join, draftmechanic.net slash slack. Join for free. Answer final rounds. It's that easy. Cool. Danielle, you want to start us off? First, D. Shannon Berry said, Deck building for its own sake is something I've never been able to get behind. Even though it was a major gateway for me, Dominion bores me to tears. But as part of a bigger game like Great Western Trail, or the focus of a very thematic experience like Hogwarts Battle, shut up and take my money. I don't think culling is essential, but if you're going to leave it out, you need some other form of deck acceleration, without things going crazy. As much as I like Hero slash Star Realms, the acceleration there definitely goes crazy, <laughs> which I agree uh-huh. with wholeheartedly. If you get a red deck in Star Realms, like you are just going to be churning through stuff, or you're going to feel like you're wasting some of the powers on your cards. Or the the blob cards, the green faction, the amount of power you get out of those cards, if you get your deck pruned down really tight, a red and green deck will just obliterate somebody in a turn and a half. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, the command decks for Star Realms that we talked about in our Gen Con hype list episode are now retail available. So if you've been looking for those, the uh, those command decks that give you the variable setups are now available. Very nice. Nate Bivens, our local Charlotte designer, says, deck building is my jam. I love both the pure deck builders and those that are a system in a larger game. My favorite is Arctic Scavengers. Culling is mandatory for a good deck builder, which is my main complaint about Clank and the like. Adrian from Mile High Game Guy says, I prefer deck building as a standalone premise, usually, but I think it is more to do with the games that use it as a part not being my thing, rather than an issue with deck building itself. For instance, I really dislike Clank and Great Western Trail, both of which have deck building, but it isn't the deck building that bothers me. Meanwhile, I love Legendary Alien and Star Slash Hero Realms, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, Arctic Scavengers, and the app for Ascension. I definitely prefer the trench style of drafts, like Legendary or Star Realms, to the pile style, like Dominion or Scavengers. Hmm. I dislike Dominion, but only because there is zero thematic connection for me. To be fair, culling is less important for me in competitive games than in co-op. I want a co-op to be hard, and hard games can be lost in a draw if you draw a bunch of weak early game cards at the wrong time. In competitive, you are at least both hampered by the lack of cull options, so it doesn't seem as painful. And I like the distinction that Adrian makes there. To say that you like or require culling may not tell the whole story. Maybe in a cooperative game you really require it but he's saying in a competitive game you're both in the same boat and while that can be frustrating because your game isn't really running along smoothly and your engine isn't humming the way you'd want it to at least everybody's under the same circumstances yeah very good point peter says among my gaming group are some deck building purists who prefer the deck building be the whole game and not a mechanic of another game so they prefer Tanto Aquare, Tea Dragon Society, and even Mystic Veil, vale, but dislike Clank. I myself enjoy both. The relevance of culling depends on the card balance. Tea Dragon Society doesn't have culling, but with the infrequency of bad or weak cards, it doesn't need it. Xenon Profiteer is all about the culling and wouldn't work without it. BJ from Board Game Gumbo said, I love a good culling mechanic and chaining mechanism so much that sometimes I forget to try and win and instead have fun building my deck. <laughs> Which is really like what I was talking about earlier. When your deck is really humming along and it feels like it's working together, it's it feels good to just burn through and make a power, activate another power, and use all the cards that are available to you. So you really do need a good culling mechanic to be able to get all the extra stuff out of the way and get that engine running smoothly. Yeah, I'll be honest. That's how I play Star Realms. I play Star Realms by like, oh, look at that card. I bet that would be fun to chain with something else. Oh, look (laughs) at that card. And then I realize that Danielle's hitting me with 20 power (laughs) this particular turn because Danielle is a ruthless deck building machine. No, I just like to play green. Yes, very true. All right, finally, as is tradition, Patrick Hillier has words to say. Both, he says. I'm still a fan of Dominion. Two players who know what they are doing, bang, 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 and it moves like clockwork. I have an ancient app called Androminion on my phone that I still play all the time. I guess that's an Android Dominion app. Yeah, Androminion. Androminion. I don't necessarily like the next generation games just because they have deck building. I didn't like Trains, where I enjoy Clank, but probably for the board movement more than the deck building. Also, where do you draw the line? Is bag building like Orléans really any different? I'd have to say I prefer some culling options, but in things like Star Realms, where it appears critical and overtakes your decisions, I guess I'd prefer something in the middle. 
Some of the Clank expansions have discard and draw. They aren't really cull, but they let you cycle through your deck faster in a cull-like fashion. I like that. I like that discard or that draw and discard thing. Passaraya has that with the supervisor as well. It allows you to draw two cards and then discard one of your choice. And I think that's a good kind of between mechanism where you're not destroying cards out of your deck, but it allows you to move through your stuff faster. I think maybe the Star Realms expansions had that as well, where you're drawing more cards and discard one. Well, yellow allows you to draw more cards, but it doesn't yeah. allow you to discard, and red allows you to call out. So mm-hmm. Star Realms actually has both of those mechanics, which m- might add to the fact that a lot of people in the Final Thoughts said it was kind of out of control in how quickly you're moving through and thinning down your deck. And I guess one final point to ruminate on, do you feel that bag builders are deck builders? Is that the same thing? Does that count? Like an Orleon or an Altiplano? Why would it not be? Well, I mean, because you have a bag instead of a deck, I guess. <laughs> Functionally, it's the same thing, though. You are randomly drawing a certain number of your available options from mm-hmm. a pool that you have that is only yours to draw from. And you are going to get the randomly selected however many that you're doing, and then you get to use with that. And when you've used everything, you put it back in and you go again. It's just a matter of whether you make a stack of flat objects or you have a containment device for generally different shaped objects, mm. circles and Altiplano and yes. Orleans. Circles. Maybe very small cylinders in War Chest because they <laughs> are, I mean, I guess they're technically cylinders with cardboard, but they're a little thicker yeah, and they're chips. They're poker chips, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with calling bag builders deck builders, but I feel like maybe we just need a new word for both of them. Can they be uh, build? No, we're not randos? doing this again. <laughs> no. All right. Well, if you're going to tell me I can't do that, then we're going to have to move on with the rest of this episode. I'm willing to do that. <laughs> like, we can move on with the episode so you don't make a new <sighs> word that doesn't mean anything. Set builders. Set Set builders? Group Those are people. They work in a theater. Fine. All right. Well, this brings us to an end of this episode of Draft Mechanic. If you would like to get in touch with us on the internet, draftmechanic.net is your one-stop shop for all your draft mechanic needs, including those fancy new draft mechanic t-shirts of the Carcassonne and the Live Studio Cat. You can get those designs right now. I don't know why we have a picture of a cat on a t-shirt, but oh, I do. I do it's also. He's it's because he's so damn cute. But also social media at Draft Mechanic on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all those typical places. And send us an email, draftmechanic at gmail.com if you would like to do that. We also have a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up for this episode so you can let us know what you think about deck builders or about Passaraya mm-hmm. or about Carcassonne South Seas or anything else we've talked about. Yeah. Maybe winter warmers if Even you really have an opinion about, on you that. Can tell us. We also have a local game night. Our next one coming up is on Thursday, December 6th at Good Road Cider Works. We would love to see you there. Oh, and before I forget, if you are a Time Stories fan and you've been playing through Time Stories with us and have finished Brotherhood of the Coast, we have released spoiler episode Theta, where we go behind the scenes on our playthroughs of Brotherhood of the Coast with our team and also Team Beta. It is available on the podcast feed and also at draftmechanic.net slash spoiler episodes if you want to go listen to that or ones we've done for any of the other scenarios so far. Seems like we might just have one more in this particular arc, with uh, Madame coming out in early spring. Fingers crossed, early spring. Yeah, and Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. And one thing that I do want to remember, come out to booth 1913 if you are going to PAX Unplugged. That is the Gray Fox Games booth. You can come by and say hi. I'll be demoing City of Gears from 2 to 6 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. City of Gears. Ah, it's here, finally. I'm really excited about this game. Even besides the fact that they sponsor us, I thought it was a really cool game, so I'm excited to get some plays of it in. Nice. I think that's everything. Yeah, Mm. okay, I'm done. It's not everything. As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly, and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. Cool. Good night. Good night. Draft Mechanic episode 89 was recorded on Sunday, November 25th, 2018 in front of a live studio cat. Stricken, do not go gently into that good life. Hey, board gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with more Louisiana flavor. Tornado Michian, we love talking board games. That's why we started up Gumbo Live, the number one Facebook live talk show dedicated to board gaming. Each week, we interview guests from your hobby publishers, designers, content creators, and you get to ask them whatever you like. It's a live show. 
So join us at Board Game Gumbo on Facebook every Tuesday night at 8.30 p.m. Central for another episode of Gumbo Live. And until next time, les le bon temps roulé. Punchboard Media. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com.